Hello friends and welcome to my new video in which I will tell you some amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories in the comments. Let's get started. The first story is Toxic Workplace Organized by a Lazy Colleague. I was a computer lab paraprofessional at an elementary school a few years ago. I was informed upon hiring that my responsibilities included lunch duty, recess duty, computer lab maintenance, and student assistance in the lab. I had no idea where to begin because I had never worked at a school before. Karen, my co-worker, loved this precisely. The principal gave me over to Karen on my first day and instructed her to teach me the parapro ways. There were a few desks in our room, but I was shown to a cheap plastic chair. My designated spot was that. I tucked my coat behind the chair and my bag beneath it. Each paraprofessional had a desk and chair. She informed me that I would be teaching students who required additional assistance and showed me folders containing instructional materials. Inquiring about the computer lab, the primary reason I was hired, I was informed that it wasn't my primary responsibility. Warning sign. At the time, there were three other paraprofessionals, one guy, one pregnant woman, and an older woman. The women appeared to be her support system. The guy would typically go off on his own and didn't give a D about the drama. At first, I didn't really think anything was wrong. I thought the chair I had was the best they had for me. I made an effort to think optimistically. Since I didn't have any experience teaching, I did terrible in the teaching group I was put in. Instead, my background was in technology. I took the instructional materials they gave me home and studied them carefully because they were confusing. Even though I could tell she wasn't in favor of it, the older paraprofessional was really helpful. Karen had so much work to do that after a while she would tell me to take both her study group and mine. She would vanish and not come back for several hours, usually holding a fast food restaurant drink in hand. When I would return from the room, I would hear the three women disparaging me. Karen laughed the hardest at every remark. Once, the parapro guy saw me standing outside the door and shrugged, saying, It is what it is. I didn't have a sense of belonging, nor had I spent much time in the computer lab. A few weeks later, I told the principal that I had been hired as a paraprofessional in the computer lab. I've once visited the lab. After some persuasion, he spoke with Karen at last. It did not sit well with her. She was upset, I was told later. She tipped off on me? Isn't that amazing? What the heck? I hear you're abandoning your study group, said Karen as she led me to the computer lab the following morning. You realize that we're under pressure from you. The children will detest you as well. I clarified that I had been employed to work in the lab. This is where I belong. I guess this is your spot now, she said, moving everything to the side of an end table. Regarding returning to the parapro room, don't worry, you will not be required. The pregnant paraprofessional entered the room as recess was about to begin and told the class and me, I see you're badly needed in the computer lab. We don't have enough staff, so recess duty won't be an issue. Remain here as long as you like. Rolling her eyes, she walked away. I shrugged and continued to assist children. Karen and the pregnant paraprofessional made small remarks every day, but I tried my best to brush them off. At least the senior paraprofessional kept quiet and occasionally assisted me. During my first complete day in the lab, I resolved minor problems on six computers. I wiped down every desk, monitor, and keyboard. They were downright repulsive. Every day, six classes would pass through the lab, six sets of hands using each mouse and keyboard. I then changed all of the damaged headphones. For months, brand new headphones were just kept in a locked closet. At last, I could communicate with the teachers. I inquired as to what the previous computer lab paraprofessional had accomplished. It seems that he was assigned to lunch duty only, not recess. Although he didn't fix much, he was the primary point of contact for IT ticket submissions. Nothing was fixed around the building because of this. I emailed the teachers to inquire if there was anything that needed to be done in their classrooms. 90% of the school's broken tech was fixed by me, and the remaining portion was fixed by sending IT tickets, which made me popular with nearly everyone. About a week later, Karen was at my door again. I have a lot going on. Could you handle my duty during recess? I simply can't right now. I concurred. After fixing and thoroughly cleaning everything, I discovered that I had more time. From then on, I gladly performed lunch and recess duty. It didn't bother me. Karen began to appear less and less during lunch and recess. The other paraprofessionals would shrug when I asked where she was. After going on maternity leave, 
the expectant paraprofessional found employment at another school. We were truly understaffed this time, which is why the older paraprofessional began to support me. Not only was Karen working on me, but she was working on everyone. It wasn't until I had to take a child to the doctor for a scraped knee that I realized what was occupying her time so much. Through the library window, I witnessed her talking loudly on the phone to her spouse while enjoying a Diet Coke on a couch. Because of construction, the library was locked, but her best friend, the secretary, gave her a key. She believed she could hide there without anyone noticing, but Karen neglected to duck behind the windows. I made the decision to remain silent. Maybe I saw her when she was taking a break. Then, even though she wasn't always on the phone, I saw the same thing happen quite a few more times. She and the janitor were friends. They would converse while enjoying Diet Cokes on the library couch. She once read a pornographic novel. She was simply dozing off at another point. She then received a promotion and started working as the media clerk for the soon-to-open library. Given that the computer lab and library are connected, this made matters worse. We were instructed to collaborate closely. I have to maintain the library just like you have to maintain the computer lab, Karen said, using this as a better justification for being lazy. I'm unable to go outside or fulfill my lunch duty at this time. The whole wall that separated my lab from the library was made of glass. Her monitor and desk were visible to me. She was on Facebook or online shopping all the time. She would keep browsing the internet while classes were held in the library. When I had a class, she would barge into my lab and tell me to help the kids in the library with their homework and tests. She knew I wouldn't turn down helping children. She would do nothing while I ran between the two rooms. I had to really say no a few times. That day, chaos reigned. All throughout the building, I could hear her yelling, I have work to do, but I have to help the kids since the lab is more important. Most often when she came by my door. But I did start to say no to her more and more. A few months later, Karen happily declared that she was leaving for a higher paying position. I felt so relieved when she was gone. After we grew closer, the older paraprofessional revealed to me things that had been said behind my back. Karen had slandered me in front of every employee. She would aggressively work to have me fired by informing the principal of everything she thought was wrong with me. Teachers, however, supported me, which infuriated her. Karen would boast to the other paraprofessionals, who were growing more and more irate that she wasn't working, that she enjoyed watching me work my A off while sipping her Diet Coke. Then I learned from the senior paraprofessional that Karen was texting her from her new position. She grumbled about constantly being on her feet and the lack of breaks. Karen's complaints would constantly buzz her phone and we would laugh about them. The senior paraprofessional turned into a great friend. For two months, right up to summer break, the library was operating without a media clerk. I cleared away the clutter that was all over her desk. I peeked into the library storage and saw bowls full of food, including soup a couple of mugs with drinks still in them, commenced a diet fast food cups and Coke cans, snack bags lying around in an open state. In order to return the very few books that were checked out, I took over the library a little bit. It seems as though she never told the children that they could borrow books. Despite being confused by her system, I returned them to the shelves. We hired a new media clerk after summer break, and he swore non-stop that nothing was organized. What did the last individual do? If only they had distinguished between fiction and non-fiction. The new media clerk was wonderful. She resembled the mother I was never given. After three to four years, I left to take a better paying job. I found a job paying double what I was making, and I gained a ton of experience fixing everything at the school. It's been a few years for Karen. A cursory perusal of Facebook reveals that she left her excellent school job to take a job at a senior citizen's house. She subsequently quit her job and relocated to a different state to be a stay-at-home mother. Even so, according to her page, she runs her household as CEO. She also seems to have briefly participated in an MLM. Edit. After her departure, everything got much better. She undoubtedly became the Queen Bee, winning the respect of the principal, lunch staff, janitor, and secretary. The drama dropped from a hundred to almost nothing. The children were the only ones I had to confront afterward. They can be really cruel. Haha. <laughs> it must have been a life lesson for you so that you could become stronger in the future. I hope you learn to stand up for your workplace and your students more. She was the one who thought you couldn't handle the work, but you proved you could do more than she expected. You overcame these difficulties and held your head high.
I think that management should control such situations and prevent toxic moods in the team because it spoils the team and the best employees will simply refuse to work and find a better job. It makes me angry when people like your former colleague treat your work as a joke. I know you didn't want to fight, but she not only took advantage of you, she harmed children by not doing her real job. Oh well, now she has decided to be the CEO of her household and you go on with your happy life. The next story is Neighbor Demands. Mr. Caldwell appeared to be amiable, courteous, and respectful at first, just like any other neighbor. But after a few weeks, he became a different person. He started examining my patio in great detail, pointing out apparent infractions and insisting that I take out certain plants or rearrange furniture. My property complied with all city codes, and I wasn't a member of any homeowners associations. Nevertheless, Mr. Caldwell invoked a HOA that, as far as I knew, did not exist and threatened to report me. Resolved not to let bullying force me from my own house, I made the choice to speak with him. In an attempt to find a peaceful solution, I invited him over for tea one afternoon. His face grimacing, he arrived holding a stack of papers he claimed contained excerpts from the bylaw. I gave his argument my full attention, but it soon became apparent that he was making up regulations to support his demands. Following our meeting, I started to feel increasingly uneasy. Unusual occurrences started to occur. Parcels vanished, my correspondence vanished, and unsolicited messages showed up on my door. I came to understand that Mr. Caldwell was using the fear of a homeowner's association to control the situation by launching a campaign to drive me out. He mentioned a HOA, so I decided to look into it. What I found concerning was that it was a fictitious organization, founded purely by Mr. Caldwell to maintain control and had no legal status. The alleged board members were made up and the documents he displayed were fake. Equipped with this proof, I went to the local council to expose his dishonesty. The council was initially dubious, but as I provided more evidence, their curiosity grew. Mr. Caldwell's plot to intimidate neighbors and inflate property values for personal benefit was discovered during an investigation. As it turned out, he controlled multiple homes in the neighborhood and was able to selectively enforce his made-up HOA rules. The community was rocked by the revelation. Previously unimpressed with Mr. Caldwell's strategies, neighbors started talking about their own experiences. We exposed his network together, which prompted a thorough investigation. He was the target of legal action for power abuse, harassment, and fraud. After the fake HOA was taken down, Mr. Caldwell was hit with harsh consequences, such as large fines and being prohibited from obtaining a property in the county. The community came together after the fallout to rebuild confidence and make sure that manipulation of this kind couldn't occur again. We created an actual neighborhood committee to supervise any upcoming conflicts, guaranteeing justice and openness. My patio was no longer threatened by dishonesty, and it once again became a symbol of peace. My neighbors proved to be unexpected allies in the aftermath. Those who had remained silent rose to their feet, encouraging one another and sharing their stories. Together, we changed the neighborhood to one in which intimidation and covert agendas gave way to mutual respect and honesty. I learned from the experience how important it is to be vigilant and to support your community. It served as a reminder that justice and constructive change can result from standing up for what is right, even in the face of overwhelming obstacles. My patio was still my haven, but it was now woven into a bigger picture of a neighborhood that was against corruption. Listen. I thought back on the trip one evening while I was sitting on my patio and enjoying the sunset. I now deeply treasured the peace that I had once taken for granted, knowing that it had been protected and maintained by resiliency and solidarity. Mr. Caldwell's power was destroyed by the harsh punishment meted out to the HOA, guaranteeing that no one else would be duped by his cunning schemes. Ultimately, by refusing to leave my patio, I was able to save my house and start a movement that improved our neighborhood. The relationships created during the conflict served as the cornerstone for a community that respected the rights and welfare of every individual. Though it was a difficult win, it was all worthwhile when we saw the joy and calm that returned to our streets. I had a strong sense of accomplishment as the stars appeared in the night sky. My house served as more than just a location. It served as a symbol of justice, resiliency, and the strength of perseverance in the face of difficulty. The patio, which had previously been the source of contention, 
now represented our group's victory over deceit and manipulation. And as I relished the cool breeze, I knew that the peace we had brought back would last forever. A testament to our shared resistance to injustice. The next story is, Karen and her kids stole my scooter. I'm 26 years old, autistic, and suffer from severe PTSD as a result of some childhood trauma that I really don't want to discuss. Both of my parents caused this trauma. I have to live in Section 8 housing, which I just moved into a few months ago after years on the waiting list, and I take several different medications for depression and migraines. Loud noises and being touched bother me. Furthermore, I detest it when someone takes my belongings. A friend had given me a brand new Razor Kick scooter to use in my new city when I moved here for the Section 8 housing, and I adore it. It has larger wheels, is made slightly more sturdy than normal for an adult to ride, and is black in color. Although they have ones that look similar in the bike department, the local stores don't sell it either. It goes without saying that I do not simply leave it outside when I enter a store. When I go shopping, I fold it up and place it in my cart. Most people leave me alone because I have a jittery appearance, and that's perfectly okay with me. But if you touch me without my permission or take anything from me, get ready for a major meltdown. I headed towards the canned food aisle and began perusing the thick soup. My scooter had vanished by the time I decided what I wanted and loaded the cans into the cart, and there was a mother carrying a child who was leaving quickly. I yelled at them to give my scooter back. However, they disregarded me, so I got off my cart and pursued them. The child screamed so loudly that I thought my eardrums were going to burst when I tried to return my scooter to the woman and child and the mother of Karen pushed down, shouting something I couldn't hear because my ears were ringing and my head was briefly blanked out. A manager came to investigate the disturbance after noticing the commotion. Before I could say anything, the Karen mother began calling me names and insisted that I be kicked out. I kept attempting to explain the true events, but Karen would only yell at me. After we split up, I was forced to sit in an office. When I asked the manager where my scooter was, he reprimanded me, telling me that it had been sold to Karen and that I shouldn't have tried to take it away from the child when they were merely attempting to purchase it from the store. Then he mentioned that the circumstances required him to give Karen a discount. Naturally, I became alarmed and informed him that Karen had stolen the scooter I had brought into the store. It wasn't sold there either. The manager just gave me a confused look, and I almost lost it. Subsequently, I took out my phone and showed him a photo that a friend had taken of me shortly after I had gotten the scooter. Before I knew it, he was frantically leaving the room and he claimed that Karen had long since vanished when he eventually returned. I took my phone out again and began frantically dialing the police. In an attempt to stop me, the manager put his hand over my phone, and I became alarmed at the thought of him touching me. I almost kicked him, so he recoiled in fear and promised to buy me another scooter from the shop. I informed him that my scooter wasn't from their store and was rather pricey, and I desired my own to be returned. It turned out that I had successfully called 911 since the operator was attempting to get my attention, and the police were already listening in on the call. My property had been stolen, so I just told them to send someone over. I was forced to wait for at least an additional hour while the police arrived and began reviewing the CCTV footage. The footage unmistakably showed me pulling the scooter into the store and Karen and her crotch goblin removing it from my cart, and the chaos I encountered while attempting to retrieve it. I needed my scooter back, and the police had to use the parking lot camera footage to track down Karen. I got to ride in the back of a police car while we went to her apartment. They used the license plate number they had from the camera footage to find her address. I was still seated in the back of the car with the windows closed, so I didn't hear the situation when the officer knocked on her door. However, the mother of Karen looked very irate, and after some back and forth, finally pulled out the scooter. She had to take it almost completely out of her child's hands. After letting me out of the car, they asked if I wanted to report the mother for assault since she had shoved me. When I said I did want that, she went completely white. However, Karen began to cry and beg me. She admitted that, in all honesty, she had assumed it was her child's birthday and something the store was selling. That didn't justify her stealing from another person's cart, much less from a man who was legally disabled, I yelled. My ears were hurting again, and her child was crying really loudly. I then threatened to drop the charges against her if she stayed away from me and my belongings. However, I wanted the store manager who allowed this to occur to be held accountable. 
and I was prepared to make the entire trip back there on my scooter. However, the police persuaded me that it would be best if I went home and collected myself. When I returned to the store a few days later, I discovered that the manager had been fired for the incident because he had received several complaints already and had neglected to make sure the scooter wasn't one of theirs. Since Karen had already paid for one, the store gave her and her child an additional Razor scooter that they had on hand. However, she was also given a six-month store ban for pushing me and stealing my stuff. Since I was unable to make any purchases on the day that mess occurred, I was also given a $50 gift card for some free groceries. Currently, several of the staff members recognize me by name each time I visit that store. And when a random kid inquired about my scooter, one of them actually told him to shut up. I do at least pay it more attention now. In case this occurs again, I have since placed a name tag with my entire name on the underside of the scooter. I'm glad you stood up for yourself. It's not easy, especially when angry currents and incompetent managers are involved. This manager should have been fired, so it was deserved. It sounds like the employees are grateful that you helped them get rid of the a-hole manager. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, comment. See you soon.